is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to VOA Africa. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. Here's what's coming up on Africa News Tonight. Trying to respond to all of these sort of medical humanitarian emergencies at the same time. And one of the biggest problems that has come up has been the, the question of sexual violence. That was Jason Rizzo, the emergency coordinator for Doctors Without Borders in the DRC's North Kivu province. Details coming up. Also, a shortage of HIV test kits looms for many low- and middle-income countries. And Malawi launches a nationwide rollout of the newest typhoid vaccine for children. These stories and more on African News Tonight. start with our top story. The International Medical Aid Group Doctors Without Borders, known by its French acronym MSF, says access to critical HIV tests is under threat because U.S. Diagnostics Corporations, Abbott Laboratories and Becton Dickinson, BD, have decided to stop making equipment to run point-of-care CD4 tests. In a statement Friday, MSF urged Abbott and BD to ensure an adequate supply of the tests and equipment. Approximately 8 million CD4 tests are needed annually in low- and middle-income countries. Stendabor Kirabit is the diagnostic advisor for MSF's access campaign. VOA's Douglas Mpuga reached him in Brussels and began by asking why these companies have decided to stop making the equipment. This is because the companies have been actually selling less of these tests in the latest years, and, and so they have made actually less profits on it. And this is largely because WHO, so the World Health Organization, has changed its guidelines a few years ago, and they recommend now to use HIV viral load testing instead of the CD4 test uh, for the monitoring of treatment outcome uh, of uh, after HIV uh, treatment. However, the CD4 Test, they remain important for other parts in HIV care. Yeah? So both these companies, so Abbott and, and BD, they are large diagnostics companies, and they often prioritize profits yeah, over public health needs. And the profit they have made or make on this particular test has probably dropped below certain thresholds, yeah, where after they just decided to stop uh, producing these tests. In your opinion, how important is the CD4 testing? No, they are very important. When people come to our clinics, our HIV clinics, because these tests, CD4 tests, they can tell us whether a person has an advanced stage disease or not. So people with advanced HIV disease, they have a much higher chance of dying because they are more vulnerable to deadly co-infections like tuberculosis or cryptococcal meningitis. So these people need a very specific package of care actually to save their lives But without the CD4 test, it's very difficult to know whether a person, when they come in to the hospital and they have HIV, whether they have also the advanced stage of the disease or not, because the symptoms are not always always clear. But these CD4 tests, they they really play a a very critical role uh, when we want to deliver uh, care. Especially in developing countries, uh, if they don't have a CD4 testing, what other alternative would they have? There is not much alternative, but there is one other Similar test in the, in the market, but it doesn't do the same thing. Eh? So it, it gives us one, one number, right? like the 200 number, uh, which we know, okay, if the CD4 uh, count is below 200, we know, okay, these people, uh, these people are, are probably advanced HIV disease. Uh, but sometimes we also want to know other numbers, eh? like, uh, like a 50 or a 350, where, where because the thresholds eh, for specific diseases or depending, uh, or the clinical actions actually depend on, on these thresholds. So there are very little alternatives, and that's the whole problem, because if these two, two companies stick to their decision to stop producing this critical equipment, I'm afraid we will be in big problems and we will uh, lose a lot of lives. The organization is calling on these two companies uh, not to stop uh, uh, producing this uh, equipment. Um, what can developing countries do to make sure that they still have the CD4 testing available? The, the important thing is to, to really use CD4 tests when they should be used. Yeah? So all HIV programs basically in a country should have them available. And it is estimated based on the WHO guidelines that 
more than 8 million of these tests would be needed every year in developing countries. So it's really important that countries use them, scale up uh, the use of CD4 tests. And it is also important, of course, that the companies, Abbott and NBD, actually reverse their decision to stop producing this important equipment. Um, as this will have a major negative impact on, on, on the lives of people with HIV. Is there any role, anything uh, that World Health Organization can do? Yeah, what we think is that the World Health Organization, they could simplify uh, and, and redesign their guidelines eh? and also make, be very clear that there is a critical role for these point of care CD4 tests in the HIV package. It is in the guidelines, but it could be made uh, more key in, in the guidelines. And also a simplification of, of some of the guidelines would be helpful for countries to implement eh, and to use and scale up uh, CD4 tests. That was Stan Dabor Krabit, the Diagnostic Advisor for MSF's Access Campaign. He spoke with VOA's Douglas Mpuga from Brussels. Doctors Without Borders, also known by the French acronym MSF, is sounding the alarm as it threats, as it treats an unusually high number of sexual assault victims in the Democratic Republic of Congo's North Kivu province. VOA's Africa correspondent Maria Madialo spoke with an MSF representative on the ground and has the story. Jason Rizzo is the emergency coordinator for MSF in North Kivu. He told VOA that clashes between the Congolese army and many armed groups, including M23, have recently led to the enormous displacement in the province of 1.2 million. We have been trying to respond to the different needs that come with mass displacement, access to health care, food, water, shelter, um, and all of the epidemics that can come with that when vaccination coverage is low, measles uh, and cholera. Um, we're, we're, we've been uh, trying to respond to all of these sort of medical humanitarian emergencies at the same time. And one of the biggest problems that has come up has been the, the question of sexual violence. Rizzo said the number of victims of sexual assault have climbed to nearly 50 per day in the past two weeks. He said a contributing factor is that people don't have enough to eat, adding that when the humanitarian response clearly does not provide basic services, people take matters into their own hands to make ends meet. Perhaps one of the reasons that the numbers uh, on our end have exploded over the last couple of weeks is that we have started providing medical services in one of the newer camps uh, called Rusayo. Now, this is one of the, uh, the most densely populated camps, but it's also located um, sort of on the, the periphery of the, the city and closer to the forest area. And so uh, people will go out, they will search for firewood, they will search for, for food, and then that is often where uh, the incident is occurring. One displaced woman living in the Rusayo camp said that shortly after arriving, her child started exhibiting signs of malnutrition. Needing to do something, she went into the nearby forest to collect firewood to sell so she can buy food, which is when she says she was attacked. MSF says it treated nearly 700 victims in the last two weeks of April in camps located in Bulengo, Lushagala, Kanyarushinya, Elwame Munigi, and Rusayo. Asked who the perpetrators are, Rizzo said it's difficult to respond with any degree of certainty. Even for the victims themselves, this is a very traumatic event. Um, we know that a good um, percentage of the victims have told us that the, they were being raped by armed men. Um, but to be able to say exactly what group that uh, a particular aggressor was a part of, it's hard for them to say, it's hard for us to say. Rizzo said MSF has been having open discussions with the various DRC authorities to ensure that services are in place so that victims can seek medical treatment within 72 hours. Sexual violence is a medical emergency, he told VOA, not something that could be treated after one, two or three weeks. The reasons, he said, is that there is a host of potential medical complications, including potential pregnancy, but also infections. 
VOA asked DRC officials for comment, including Major Guillaume Jike, DRC Goma military spokesperson. Jike said authorities were looking into it but did not elaborate. This week, Congolese President Felix Chisekedi threatened to end the mandate of the East African Community Regional Force, whom he accused of working with M23 rebels, a group that claims to represent the interest of the minority Tutsis in eastern DRC. East African forces have been deployed in the eastern part of the country to help fight M23 and other armed groups there. Last month, Regional Force Commander Major General Jeff Niaga lauded the ongoing stability efforts in eastern DRC, saying the ceasefires among warring parties have been holding for over a month and they've seen significant withdrawal of M23 from certain areas. Shortly after, Niaga resigned abruptly. Mariama Jalu, VOA News, Nairobi. The world's biggest chocolate producers are enjoying record profits but are failing to pass on the benefits to cocoa farmers, many of whom are suffering falling incomes and worsening poverty, according to a report from the charity Oxfam. Henry Ridgewell reports. Ghana is the world's second largest producer of cocoa. Farmers' incomes in the country fell 16% on average since the start of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020, according to Oxfam's analysis. Uwe Geniting is a co-author of the report from Oxfam America. COVID, of course, was a big disruption, but then also the the war in Ukraine and the resulting uh, economic crisis, um, coupled with some more longer-term challenges like the impact of climate change and Um, aging farms, which is a big um, issue in Ghana. Oxfam says many Ghanaian cocoa farmers survive on just $2 a day. Again, Uwe Gneiting. Lower incomes really have shown to um, facilitate the use of children on farms, so child labor, um, which is a big problem, of course, in in Ghana and and other cocoa-producing countries. Um, But also deforestation, that farmers are more likely to go out and cut down more trees in order to expand their farms, in order to make a living. At the same time, Oxfam says profits for the world's biggest chocolate firms, Hershey, Lindt and Sprungli, Mondelez and Nestle, have increased by 16% since the pandemic. Again, Uwe Geniting. And that translates into 15 billion of profit by just the four largest uh, public chocolate companies since 2020. Ivory Coast is the world's biggest producer of cocoa. Here, too, farmers complain of falling incomes. Farmer Julian Koame Conan said, We planters are poor. The Westerners who come to buy cocoa are getting rich. Meanwhile, we are suffering. We earn nothing. We suffer cultivating the fields. That's why we ask the government to help us. The governments of Ghana and Ivory Coast signed a deal in 2021 to try to get a bigger share of the chocolate industry's profits by setting a minimum price and obtaining a cash premium per tonne of cocoa, which is an extra sum paid directly to farmers on top of the commercial price of cocoa. But Oxfam says the payments have failed to meaningfully increase farmers' incomes. Again, report co-author Uwe Geniting. If you as a company are profitable at the same time as the, the, the producers of your most critical raw material are falling deeper into poverty, then there's something wrong with your business model. Lint and Sprungli told VOA they pay Ghanaian farmers a $60 per tonne premium and invested over $20 million in cocoa sustainability programs in 2021. Hershey said it aims to support better livelihoods for farmers with cash transfers and loans. Mondelez and Nestle did not respond to VOA requests. He has launched a nationwide rollout of the newest typhoid vaccine for children below 15 years of age. A two-year study of the vaccine, the first in Africa, found it safe to use and effective in more than 80% of recipients. Health authorities say vaccine is expected to reduce the threat from a disease that kills close to 20,000 people in sub-Saharan Africa each year. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre, Malawi. Typhoid is a contagious bacterial infection caused by consuming contaminated foods 
or drinks. Its symptoms include nausea, fever, abdominal pain, and if left untreated, it can be fatal. Malawi Health Authorities say the launch of the typhoid conjugate vaccine or TCV will be part of a nationwide program expected to start Monday when children will be vaccinated against three other diseases, measles, rubella, and polio. However, some fear the campaign will encounter hesitancy and resistance from people, as was the case with COVID-19 vaccines, which led to banning of about 20,000 expired doses in Malawi in 2021. George Job is the chairperson for Universal Health Coverage Coalition in Malawi. He told the VOA that efforts were made to educate people on the importance of the campaign. Considering that um, this campaign is going to be unique for the first time, we we'll have uh, almost four vaccines. The other thing that happened was the training of uh, community health care workers as well as the teachers so that uh, they take messages to community readers who should also take the messages to their subjects. Typhoid has long been a heavy threat in Malawi and across sub-Saharan Africa with an estimated 1.2 million cases and 19,000 deaths each year. In 2018, Malawi became the first country to use the TCV vaccine to fight typhoid infections in children under clinical trials. Over 20,000 children from 9 months to 12 years of age took part in a clinical trial in Malawi led by Professor Melita Gordon of the University of Liverpool. The trial proved the vaccine is safe for infants and young children in Malawi with a more than 80% effectiveness rate. Priyanka Patel is an understudy doctor at Malawi Liverpool Welcome Program. She told VOA that this vaccine can offer protection for at least four years, making it a highly effective and efficient tool for preventing the spread of typhoid. Secondly, conjugate vaccine can be given to children as young as six months old, making it easier to reach vulnerable populations. And this is in contrast to the older typhoid vaccines, which were not approved for use in young children. In Malawi, the TCV vaccine was expected to be rolled out in 2021, but was postponed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Gian Franco Rotigriano is the country representative for UN Children's Agency in Malawi. He urges the government to prioritize its immunization campaign in had to reach areas where most of the children are unvaccinated. The vaccination is right, health is right, so we should uh, definitely look for those children that uh, are not vaccinated because in, in urban areas sometimes or, or in big villages or in towns even like this, most of the children are already vaccinated, but there are others that never got even one dose of vaccine. Government authorities hope the campaign will be a success following the efforts they have put in place to educate people on the importance of vaccinating children. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. Mauritanians voted on Saturday in the first legislative and local election since 2019. Results from the first round of voting are trickling in. To brief us more on the matter, I talked to VOA's Idris Afal, editor at our French to Africa service, who has been closely following the election. The results are coming out, and uh, apparently the party of the president, Gazwani, is leading, even though the opposition party, mostly the Tawasul Islamic Party, they are calling for the cancellation of the of the vote, but uh, we don't know yet. Now there is a noble uh, party which is uh, made an alliance with the anti-slavery guy, called Biram Uld Abed. Uh, also, they are contesting the election, but I think the party of uh, the actual president may take uh, the lead. So, Idris, uh, I understand this is the first round. When is the second round scheduled to choose the remaining National Assembly seats? The, 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 the second round is, uh, I think, uh, on May 27 to choose half of the 176 seats at the National Assembly. But, you know, the opposition mainly 
is around the capital. And uh, from what I heard is uh, even the party of the president, they are saying that they want already a former neighborhood called Arafat, which was pro-Islamist party conservator called Tewasul. So the, the government is saying that they want that neighborhood in Rakhine. But uh, that is the problem. The, the party of the president is the only one which is present in all the regions in the whole country. The other political parties are mainly around the capital. And and lastly, Idrissa, uh, presidential elections uh, are slated for next year. Uh, Absolutely. The, so let's talk a little about uh, President Mohammed Ould the Ghazwani. He came to power in 2019. And then since then, he has overseen the West Africa countries relative stability in the violence racked Sahel. Will Absolutely. he be running for re-election next year? He haven't he haven't said anything yet. Yet. But it's quite sure that he I think since he uh, uh, was the one the former chief of the army who really, really, really fought hard against the Islamists because Mauritania people tend to forget it was the first country hit by uh, jihadists. And uh, I think him and the former president, Aziz, he's put in trial now. One thing they did very good is since then you don't hear jihadist attacks in Mauritania. But the overall thing is uh, the poverty is growing and people are very angry about that. And uh, especially in North Shot. And uh, people see that this is a country which has a lot of oil, which have a lot of pieces and uh, people are living very poorly uh, in the capital. So that may be a challenge for him. But he has not said yet he's going to run or not run. That was VOA's Idrissa Fall from Mali's interim military government has rejected a UN Human Rights Office report on the alleged execution of at least 500 people by Malian soldiers and unidentified foreign fighters during an operation last year. Reuters reports the ruling junta was responding to a report released Friday after a month-long investigation into what rights groups describe as the worst atrocity in a 10-year conflict between Islamist groups and the army. The report said Malian soldiers and foreign personnel descended in the helicopters on the village of Mora on March 27th last year and opened fire on fleeing residents. It said in the following days, hundreds more were shot and thrown into ditches. The UN report was based on interviews with victims and witnesses in the West African country, as well as forensic and satellite imagery. It said Malian authorities denied requests by the UN fact-finding team to access the village of Mora itself. And with that... And with that, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest development on the continent 24-7... 